Good morning. It is a gift to be with you all. And yes, there are a lot of us around. I mean, I, Keith has been here. My dad and mom are here. I have a daughter who's a professor at Dort University. There are just a bunch of us doing this theology thing. You know, JP asked us to think about things of God's faithfulness. And as I was thinking about that and reflecting on that, my mind went back to Thursday night and uh, to the fact, remember this like four days ago, it was like 40 degrees hotter than it is right now? <laughs> and I, I just thought about that a little bit. And we were actually here celebrating my mom's birthday. And I'll leave it to her to tell you how old she is. Uh, but we were celebrating her birthday, and we were supposed to be at a park in Grand Rapids, and I thought to myself, you know, a small sign of God's faithfulness is being part of a community of people who, when you call them on Wednesday night and say, we think it's going to be too hot, can we use a space in the church? They say, well, of course, come on in. And God's faithfulness. And, and I finished up uh, that about 7.30, and I scooted across the hall into one of the classrooms and, and fired up my computer, which fortunately was on its own power for a little later in the evening, uh, and had a conversation with a church called Kinderhook Reformed Church. It's in upstate New York that started in 1677. And had a conversation with them. I was with them a little while ago about what they're going to do next in their life of ministry. Over 300 years of ministry in that congregation, a sign of God's faithfulness. You know, the stories we can tell, right? The stories that we can tell about God's faithfulness. And, and you kind of think about summertime a little bit. And summer is kind of a season of stories. You know, you read a novel on the beach, you go watch something on the big screen, uh, you do what our family has done this summer. We did a binge watch of something called Dark Winds, which is a story that happens in New Mexico on the Navajo Reservation and happens in the 1970s. But for our family, it's this big deal because we lived out in New Mexico for eight years and so they start talking about the different places and show the different spots and we say, hey, we know all of those places. We even know some Navajo when they say some stuff, we can actually know what they're saying. But it's all about these stories. So think a little bit about this past summer and, and think about the stories that have been going through your mind. Maybe it is a novel on the beach. Maybe you did go see some movie. Or maybe it was a scary campfire story that you told your grandkids. Now the great thing about stories is stories aren't just stories. Stories have power. Stories can shape us and mold us and form us into a certain kind of people. An author by the name of Jonathan Gottschall talks about this, and he says this. As soon as my iPhone decides it's going to be good to me and do what I want it to do, it's not going to. It's just going to be all cantankerous. Story teaches us facts about the world influences our moral logic and marks us with fears, hopes, and anxieties that alter our behavior. Research shows that stories keep nibbling and needing us, shaping our minds without our knowledge. The more deeply we are cast under a story spell, the more potent its influence. The more deeply we are cast under a story's spell, the more potent its influence. Let me ask you, what is the story that has you under its influence? Is it a story of conspiracy? Is it a story that your favorite news channel tells? Is it a story of something that you heard or saw this past summer that keeps coming back to you and keeps shaping and molding, nibbling and kneading at your life? For those of us who are followers of Jesus here, there is a story that we want to have a potent influence in our lives. It is the story of creation, fall, redemption, recreation. We might call it God's big story. We say we want this big story, we want that story more than any other story to shape, mold, and form our lives. This big story, the one true story of the whole world. We want to be able to say this is our story and this is the song that we sing. And along with that, 
We have a deep desire to be shaped by the story of Jesus. To have his story be the story that we sing. To have his story be our story. So this morning, this is our story. This is our song. Looking at Jesus. So listen to a bit of the story. This is the beginning of the good news, the gospel, of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Simon, Andrew, James, John, and Jesus came to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, they went to the synagogue and Jesus began to teach. And all the people were amazed because he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Suddenly, a man possessed by an impure spirit shouted out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently. And with a shriek came out of the man. Everyone who was there was amazed. And they said to one another, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? Even the evil spirits obey him. And news spread about him throughout all of Galilee. When they left the synagogue, along with James and John... They came to the house of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was sick with a fever, and immediately they told Jesus about it. Jesus went over to her, took her by the hand, helped her up, and the fever left her. And she began to wait on them. That night, after sunset, People brought those who were sick and those who were demon-possessed to Jesus. They all gathered around the door of the house he was in, and he healed all kinds of people of various diseases, and he cast out demons. But he didn't let them talk because they knew who he was. Early the next morning, before the sun came up, Jesus went out to a solitary place to pray. Simon and his companions came looking for him. And when they found him, they said to him, everybody's looking for you. Jesus said to them, we better leave this place. We've got to go to other places, to other villages, so that I may preach the good news, because that is why I have come. So they went throughout Galilee. Jesus preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. A man with leprosy came and fell down on his knees before Jesus and begged him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He looked at the man, reached out and touched him, and said, I am willing, be clean. And instantly, the man's leprosy left him. These are the very words of God from Mark chapter 1. This is our story. This is our song. This is the story that we want to mold and shape us. This is the song that we want to sing in the world. This is our story. This is our song. As we step into the story, Jesus and his disciples are going to Capernaum, and they go in to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And immediately we see a difference between Jesus and John the Baptist. John the Baptist spent his time out in the wilderness. Jesus comes into the very center of power, the power of the Pharisees. The synagogue was the, spirit, was the power base of the Pharisees. And later on, Jesus will leave that place and he'll go to the temple, which is the power base of the Sadducees. 
where John spent his time out in the wilderness, Jesus says, I am going to come to the very crossroads of power. I'm going to speak in those places into the issues of the day. And you see, it was always supposed to be that way. The people of Israel, when they end up in the land of Israel, aren't sitting in a place that's kind of backwater, disconnected from everything. Instead, they're at the very crossroads of life. It is the place through which large trade routes go. The place that kings have to go through to go to battle with each other. And God said to the people of Israel, here's the thing. I put you at the crossroads so you can stand before the world and show the world what it means to serve and love and follow Yahweh. And when the nations see what that's all about, they will say, that's what we want for ourselves. And they will come flooding to Jerusalem to the temple of God. They fail. Often miserably. But now Jesus shows up and he picks up that occupation of the people of Israel and says, I am going to do my ministry at the very crossroads of life. I'm going to speak into the issues of the day, the things that are going on in the world. And one day the apostle Paul will take it all the way and end up at the very center in Rome. You see, this is our story. This is our song. It's not a story lived out in the wilderness far away from things, but at the very crossroads of life. In art, in architecture, education, business, neighborhood. Our story is lived at the center of things where we speak to the issues of the day and we apply the gospel to what's going on in the world. That is our story. That is our song. As the story continues, Jesus teaches in the synagogue, and he teaches as one who has authority. And the people are amazed because he teaches as authority, not as one of the teachers of the law. The teachers of the law, you see, would take something somebody else had taught and they'd comment on it. But here Jesus is stepping in with a whole new teaching. The people say, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? In other words, Jesus is saying, I am going to give you a new way of life, a different way of following after God. And you see this throughout his teaching, but particularly, I think, in one spot, and that's Matthew chapter 5 through 7, which we often call the Sermon on the Mount. But I kind of think of it as Jesus' kingdom manifesto. That he says, you want to know what it looks like to live in my kingdom? You want to know what it looks like to live in my ways? Here it is. And over and over again in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, he says, You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. And then he talks to us about things like forgiving our enemies, being people of outrageous generosity, people of pure sexuality, and so much more. And he gets to the end of it all and he says, You want to know how this works? There are all kinds of people who hear my teaching, but the wise person not only hears my teachings, but they do my teaching. See, this is our story. This is our song. It's not a story that's lived on the edge of things. It's a story that's lived at the very crossroad in every sector, every every sphere of human life. And it's a story in which we have a teacher who comes speaking with authority and shows us the best pathway of life and says, wise people follow this pathway. The story, the song, the story. Jesus is teaching with authority. And suddenly in the middle of all of it, this guy with an impure spirit, an evil spirit, jumps up and says, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Crush us? Wipe us out? Get rid of us? And Jesus' answer is, Absolutely. Absolutely, I've come to crush you. Absolutely, I've come to destroy you. Absolutely, I've come to get rid of you. Because wherever Satan and his minions get involved, people find their lives destroyed. It's not that Jesus is touchy. It's not that Jesus says, well, you know, you're messing with my power. No, Jesus looks and he says, whenever Satan and his minions get involved, People are destroyed. They are people who are kept from flourishing as God desires them to flourish. 
There's an African-American theologian, James Cone, who talks about this particular passage. And this is what he says. This part of the story discloses that God in Jesus has brought liberation to the poor and the wretched of the land. That liberation is none other than the overthrow of everything that is against the fulfillment of their humanity. Or putting it in Jesus' words, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is our story. This is our song. The story that tells us that we have a Jesus who comes to destroy the devil and all his work because he wants us to have life and have it to the full. A story that is not lived at the periphery but at the very crossroads of life itself. A story in which we have somebody who teaches us with authority and says the wise person follows this authority. That's our story. That's our song. That's the story. That's the song that we want to shape us, that we want to have as part of our lives, that we want to live into and then live out in the world. This is our story. This is our song. The story. They leave the synagogue. And they come to Simon and Andrew's house. They come in and Simon's mother-in-law is in bed with a fever. And it's kind of this odd little piece, at least in my mind. So they tell Jesus about the fever thing, and he goes over, he reaches up, down to her, takes her by the hand, lifts her up, fever's gone, and she starts waiting on them. And for me, it's kind of an odd thing, because here we are at the beginning of the good news, the gospel of Jesus the Messiah, and you would think, how about raising somebody from the dead? Not something that takes a couple Tylenol. And yet that's where Jesus starts. And I think Mark in this gospel wants to tell us something that's really pretty important. And that is that the very first person healed in the gospel of Mark is a woman. A woman who is considered less than a woman who really doesn't have a place in the kingdom of God. A woman who many rabbis every morning would pray, thank you God you did not make me a woman. This was somebody who was considered the least, the last, the outside. And as the kingdom of God is proclaimed, as the good news of Jesus the Messiah comes, the very first person that is reached down to and lifted up and healed is a woman. And Jesus is saying, my kingdom is for the least and the last and the outsider. My kingdom is for those that you consider less than, least. That's who this place is for. That's who belongs. That is part of the family. That is part of the story. So she gets up. And she starts waiting on them. And again, this is just my thing, right? I go, really? She's been sick. Get your own sandwich. <laughs> but again, Mark wants to bring something home to us. So if you go through the Gospel of Mark, when it says she serves, she waits on them, the word is diakoneo, and some of you can hear the word deacon in that. Uh, but there are two others who actually serve and wait in the book of Mark. Just two. The first one, if I had read the entire first chapter, you would have heard right away. But here it is from chapter 1, verse 13. And Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels waited on him. So who waits on Jesus? the angels, and Simon's mother-in-law, who is part of the kingdom, this lowly woman who is lifted up by Jesus, healed by Jesus, and then already in chapter 1, she's being compared to the angels who wait on Jesus. And then in chapter 10, there's one other instance of somebody waiting, although this time the word served is used for diakoneo, and it goes like this. These are Jesus' words. 
For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus and the angels. That's who serves in Mark's gospel. Oh, and Simon's mom. Simon's mother-in-law. You see, this is our story. This is our song. It's a story of someone who's considered lesser than being lifted up, healed, and then serving like Jesus and the angels. It's a story that's lived not in the periphery, but at the crossroads of life. It's a story where we have a teacher who teaches with authority and says, follow my wise ways. It's a story where Satan says, have you come to destroy me? And the answer is, yes, absolutely, because you are robbing people of flourishing. This is our story. This is our song. This is the story that molds and shapes us. This is the story that brings us to the crossroads of life where we proclaim the story into the world. This is our story. This is our song. There's more to the story that we could pick out. Jesus heals more people. He goes early in the morning and he prays. But for this morning, for this part of the story, we just want to grab one last piece And that is that this man with leprosy comes to Jesus and he falls down before him and he says, if you are willing, you can heal me. And Mark tells us that Jesus is indignant. Why? Why is Jesus indignant? Is he indignant because the man did not yell unclean, unclean, and he got too close to Jesus? Is he indignant because he wanted to get to the next town and preach more in one of the synagogues and this guy's slowing him down? Why is Jesus indignant about this man coming up to him and asking to be healed? For me, the answer comes actually later in Mark's gospel, the only other time in Mark's gospel when Jesus is indignant. Many of you will recognize the story about some children People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Jesus is indignant. When somebody who should be allowed and brought in and welcomed into the kingdom of God is kept out. Jesus is indignant when those who should be welcomed into the kingdom of God are kept out. Now, if you know your Old Testament a little bit, you know that lepers and the like were supposed to go around crying out, unclean, unclean, and they're supposed to be disconnected from the community. All of that is true. But you also know that the reason they had to cry out unclean had much deeper roots. It had roots back to the beginning of time when all of creation comes crashing down and sin and brokenness enter into the world. That's where it started. And Jesus is coming into the world and saying, I am resetting the story. I am bringing with me a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And as I bring that new creation Those who at one time were not welcomed in are now now welcomed in. Those who were unclean are now made clean. I love how one person summarizes what Jesus has done in this brief moment. The person says this. When Jesus touches the leper, he interrupts the entire social and religious order. In healing the leper, Jesus not only restores him to physical health, but restores this unclean, shamed outsider to community and social standing. When Jesus touches the leper, he changes a system of exclusion that created a living death for countless people, not just for lepers, by isolating them from the community. And they're bringing it a little bit closer to our time. There's something called our world belongs to God. It's a contemporary testimony. And it says this. In our world where many journey alone, 
nameless in the bustling crowd. Satan and his evil forces seek whom they may scatter and isolate. But God, by his gracious choosing in Christ, gathers a new community. Those who by God's gift put their trust in Christ. In this new community, all are welcome. The homeless come home. The broken find healing. The sinner makes a new start. The despised are esteemed, the least are honored, and the last are first. Here the Spirit guides and grace abounds. This is our story. This is our song. This is the story that we want to live. This is the song that we want to sing. This is our story. A story lived not at the edges, but at the very crossroads of life. A story in which we have one who teaches in such, with such authority that we go, this is the wisest person who's ever lived. A story where when, de- when Satan says, are you here to destroy me? The answer is absolutely yes, because we want people to flourish. It is a story where the least are lifted up and considered to be on par with Jesus and the angels as they serve. It is the story where those who have been not welcomed into the kingdom are now welcomed there and they become part of the family. This is our story. This is our song. This is the story. This is the song of which we are a picture, a foretaste, a scout, and an ambassador. A picture. When people look at Cascade Fellowship and they see what's here, they say, so that's what it looks like. When people live the story and sing the song of Jesus, that's what it looks like. We are a foretaste. We go out into the community and we give people a taste of this good news. The good news of a wise teacher, the good news of the least being lifted up, the good news of those who are not welcomed are now welcomed home, the good news of destroying the evil that keeps people from, we give them a taste of that. And we are a scout. We look out into our community and we say, we do not have the corner on the story. We do not have a corner on the song. Who else is telling the story? Who else is singing the song? And how do we join together with them? We are a picture. We are a foretaste. We are a scout. We are an ambassador as we enter every sector of human life, from art to architecture, from education to business, to what we do in our neighborhood, to how we play a basketball game. We are ambassadors of Christ, not only telling the story, but living the story before them. You see, this is our story. This is our song. And as we as a congregation enter this time that Bill was talking about a few moments ago, as we enter this time together of asking God, how do you want us to tell the story? How do you want us to sing the song? We say, how do we live the story well? How do we sing, great is thy faithfulness, in a way that the world can hear, in a way that the world can find hope, and life as they join the story and they sing the song with us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Pray with me. Father God, help us to be shaped and molded by your story. Help us to sing that song that flows from the story with gladness. Lord, there are so many stories that compete for your story. So many songs that call us to sing them. But Lord, help us to find our deepest gladness, our greatest joy in your story. Help us to find that we are shaped and molded and formed by that story more than any other. And Lord, let your people sing the song with gusto, with wonder, and in a way that says to others, come, join the song with us. In Jesus' name, amen.